So, hi guys, my name is Hamam. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a machine, engineering, machine learning engineer right now. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about something exciting, really exciting, which is about music technology. It's not just about music technology, it's music technology with AI, or I should call it deep learning, because AI is just a buzzword, and I hate to call it AI. So it's music technology and deep learning, and an intersection of both. I will show you today with tons of demos on how uh, deep learning can be applied in music stuff. So what is music technology? A lot, a lot of sound demos that you can hear. Hopefully the audio stuff works today. Yeah, so without further ado, uh, I just want to get a sense of the audience today. So give me a show of hands if how many of you uh, have a background in AI and deep learning and machine learning. Anyone? Anyone knows or take courses about Machine learning, deep learning. Yeah, so don't be afraid. Just show your hands. Uh, yeah, I see a few. I see a few. Anyone has a background in music? So you play an instrument, you play piano, you play guitar. Anyone? No? No one? I see one. I see a few. I see a few. Okay, quite quite some. Uh, anyone has used a music software before? For example, Audacity or Adobe something something or Bandland. Yeah, Garage Band. Okay, thank you. So, uh, mainly coders, I suppose, uh, computer science students. Any non coders here? Great, welcome, welcome. Yeah, uh, yeah, so I get the sense. Uh, without further ado, just a little bit of introduction about me. So, I graduated from NTU, your rival, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I love NS hackers a lot, the NTU as a by the way. Yeah. Uh, I have a physical background and I uh, have an APRSM piano with it long time ago. I don't really touch the piano right now. Uh, fortunately, I got the chance to actually marry two of my interests, both in tech and also in music. So right now, I'm doing machine learning stuff and DSP stuff in uh, BandLab. If you don't know about BandLab, BandLab is a music creation application. So you can like, record and sing stuff just on your mobile phone. So yeah, a lot of engineering difficulties that you need to solve because it's a mobile phone. It's not uh, a desktop. Uh, yeah, previously I do recognition stuff, so I do music content recognition, it's like Shazam, so like you will sing to a blog, hey, what song is this? It's music content recognition. And also I did uh, music generation a uh, long time ago, and actually music generation is my final year project thesis. Yeah. So pretty much a lot of experience in uh, music and tech and stuff. Uh, I want to start with what is music technology, because it's like very atas term, because no one actually knows about music technology. Like very chin thing. Actually, it's not very chin. Uh, music technology can be very common. It can start from music instruments, like how something emits sounds. For example, a guitar. A guitar is a piece of technology. Why? Because just from the design of the guitar, how you play the guitar, how the sound is being emitted. So a guitar has sound by plucking the string. So when you pluck a string, the string starts to vibrate, and the plucky sound has the first percussive sound, something like that. And then you have the song vibrating. Once the, vib the string vibrates, it goes into this very big resonance box. And then it amplifies the sounds, and that's where you get your guitar sound. So all these are physics and technology in all of our music instruments. Not just guitar, but also your trombone, your cello, your violin, your piano. Box, right? These are all technologies. Of course, there are newer technologies right now. We have hardware circuits, we have digital stuff, and so on. So this on the left, is called a rose. It's actually a variant of an electric piano. I believe you have heard of some of the sounds. Let me just play an example for you. Yeah, so this is a rose. It's very popular in the 60s. Uh, here we have some examples of synthesizers. Synthesizers are generic sound uh, design tools. You should have heard of some. I just want to recommend one of you, one for you, which is the Yamaha DX7. It's a very popular thing in the 80s. Uh, one example I probably can show you today is, I think, this song, Take My Breath Away. The bass line is played by a synthesizer called the DX7. Let me listen to it. Yeah, so the bass line is actually played by these synthesizers. And synthesizers are a big thing in uh, music technology. Yeah. Uh, other than instruments, uh, also about recording and notation and editing. So a long time ago, music cannot be recorded. You can just listen. Right now, it can be recorded on tapes, on gramophones, on vinyls, right? 
uh, do you guys know what this black thing is? Do you guys know what it is? Yes, cassettes. Good. Hopefully, the 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 all, all the young guys knows. Yeah, this is a cassette tape. It's just a very small and compact thing for uh for emulating a tape, right? And going into the digital era, we have all this software that you are using the score notation softwares, your GarageBand, your Ableton, your BandMap, yeah, and your any other softwares that you are using to record and annotate stuff in music. And in these softwares, you see a lot of analysis going on. Some of the analysis might look like this on the left hand side. This is what we call a spectrogram. A spectrogram is a visual representation of an audio. So it basically tells you in pictorial uh, visual representation how something sounds like. So if I'm going to play the audio of the corresponding uh, audio of this uh, spectrogram, it will sound something like this. It always like that. Right? So it basically goes. Da, 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 da. So by looking at the spectrograms, you already know how this audio will sound without listening to it. So this is the beauty of spectrograms, which you will later talk about. So this is part of musical analysis, a very important thing in music technology, right? Uh, this is a software which is called Melodyne, which is very famous for pitch shifting sounds. So I'm going to show you a demo again about how music technology just blow up Ed Sheeran's uh, perfect. So this Ed Sheeran's perfect, just mind you, because I can't recognize this song once it's playing Melo Time. So let's go. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. So you see the curves and the blocks, those are actually uh, very intensive analysis going on. This is part of music transcription, where we transcribe a sound into what we call MIDI symbolic notation. And the curves is actually the pitch, and you can just pitch shift it and make some rubbish like this anyway. Yeah, so these are all music technology examples that happens in our day to day. Like, we might use it, but we might not see the back side of it, right? And the bottom one is actually called a down beat detection. So when you have a sound going on, where is the strong beat? Where is the drum playing? Where is the snare playing? So this is also the analysis part of music technology. So as you can see, music technology is an intersection or combination of art and science, music and science. So it's a highly interdisciplinary field. So on one side, on the left, you will see that you need probably music theory. If you know a bit of it, like chords, scales, those kinds of things. If you know signal processing, that would be great because you know how signals get processed. On the right side, of course, because we are building softwares, right? So all of us, like we know software engineering, we take software engineering courses. These are still important skills for math, coding, and also if recently you want to apply, let's say, AI or machine learning, then machine learning also is a skill that's needed in music, music technology. So it's a highly dis interdisciplinary, it's a highly interdisciplinary field. Yeah, but don't be worried about it. Because not all of us know everything. We often collaborate. Let's say for me, I'm the more machine learning and coding based guy. So I'm more like you guys are computer science guys. So I'll collaborate more with musicians and also some DSP people to actually complement with the other parts. Yeah. Uh, before I jump into all the fun demos, I want to just spend some time to talk about some basics of uh, sound and music, right? So we know that how sound can be heard. So sound are actually vibrations of air particles. Sound are being caused by vibrations, and vibrations cause waveforms in air particles, right? But as we know, waveform is something continuous, right? But then our computer is a discrete machine, is a digital machine. It needs to ingest discrete samples, right? So what we need to do is we need to do something called sampling, okay? So from a very continuous wave, we need to sample. <coughs> at some kind of frequency, right? So in this very simple example, you have continuous wave, and then let's see if this length is one second, you have 13 samples, it basically means your sampling rate is 13 hertz. Yeah, I think that's clear now. And 13 hertz is really, really low because uh, the industrial standard for sampling rate is normally 44.1 thousand hertz or 48 hertz, if, uh, 48 thousand hertz if you're going for high fidelity. If you guys are, Real audio files for your earphones and microphones and stuff. You probably know about this magic number 44.1 and 40. Yeah, this is the sampling rate, which means in the industrial terms, if everything you listen in your Spotify, one second of audio 
has 44.1 protein, uh, 44.1 thousand protein constituents or epidermis. Right. So that's the amount of data that we are talking about. And later you will see like, how this affects immune processing. Right. Uh, the second thing is also if you have taken a uh, single processing course, this guy, this enemy, you will know him very well. His name is Joseph Fourier. Yeah. So this is actually a depiction of Fourier analysis. Right. He basically tells you that any sound wave can be decomposed into an infinite sum of sinusoids, basically sine and cosines. So if you look at this deep file, so uh, you have a square wave, right? And it, you, it basically tells you uh, that a square wave is basically a sum of sinusoids at different frequencies. And as long as you add on more and more sine waves, you will get a better and better approximation of the square wave. And this applies to any waveform, right? What this tells us? This tells us that any waveform can basically be represented in two kinds. One is the waveform itself. The other thing is we can represent it as all these frequency components, right? Because you can represent something as a sum of sine waves, then we can just we just need to notate what is the frequency component of each sine wave, right? Which means audio can be represented in two ways. One is the time domain, one is the frequency domain, as we have seen just now on the spectrogram. And the spectrogram, which means that the x-axis is actually the time, and then the y-axis is basically the frequency component of each of the sine waves. So, uh, basically, we know now that looking at audio, we have two types of lenses or two types of glasses, two different perspectives. So, one of it is time domain. What time domain analysis tells us? It basically tells us about the intensity of the sound across time, the change of intensity. So, let's say if you're looking at a piano sound, like a piano sound looks something like this, which makes sense because piano sound is made by hitting a string. So, it's something like that. So at first you have a fast attack, very, very fast attack, which is hitting the string. And once the string vibrates, energy dissipates, and you have something like an exponential decay curve. So it makes sense, right? Violin is different because for violin you need to do a up and down bow. So normally you go, so you drag, right? You drag and make the string vibrate. So you have a very slow attack. Then you have a very long sustain because normally you do a treble or something like that. Right? And then you have a fast release depending on your goal. So this tells us the amplitude. This is what we call the amplitude envelope of a sound. And this is quite important in one part of the analysis because from the amplitude envelope, we can tell where a note or a beat starts. Because if you have a sharp attack, basically that's where the drums are hidden or basically where the note play. So that's where you can do all your analysis. If you're in the frequency domain, um, normally, normally, not all the case, but normally, the lowest, uh, the lowest high energy bar, which is this one, is what we call fundamental frequency. Fundamental frequency is basically what we perceive in our ear, whether it's a high pitch sound or low pitch sound. So if it's a female sound, then this fundamental frequency will be much higher. But if it's a male sound, then this fundamental frequency will be lower. Something like that, right? And um. What about the above parts? So we talked about the fundamental frequency. The above parts are what we call the harmonic distribution. This defines what the sound sounds like. Because these are the other sine waves, right? So if you have a piano sound and a violin sound, this harmonic distribution will be different. And now we call it a timbre, the timbre of the sound. And frequency domain analysis can help us in, for example, instrument detection. If you look at just two different spectrograms, you can even, uh, if you are still enough, you can immediately know which is a piano, which is a violin, and stuff. And we can use this, let's say, for a simple classification task. It's a good feature, right? So, we talk about the audio side. We talk about audio, we talk about time domain, we talk about frequency domain. But, if you are a composer, you will know that sound waves are not intuitive. For example, if I want to edit something or I want to compose something, if I look at this, I'm not going to know what is happening inside the sound wave. Because this sound wave is just wave. It doesn't tell me anything. So, for musicians, normally we have a second type of representation, which looks something like this at the bottom. This is what we call a MIDI track. It's a symbolic notation of music. If you don't know what a MIDI track is, you can go on YouTube and you can sometimes can find something like this. So this is a very heavy, a little lamb, yeah, something like that. So looking at this, you already know this is very heavy little lamb because it tells you the notes. It tells you the symbolic music information. And this is what we need. 
So this is another way of representing music. It's called MIDI, Musical Instrument Digital Interface. So how you understand it is, it's like speech and text. So in the music world, text is like our MIDI. So if you, let's say you look at a waveform, you don't know somewhat, what, what someone is talking about, but you look at the text, aha, this is what that guy is speaking about. It's the same thing in music. So you have music audio, you also have MIDI, which you can understand as the text for music. Right? A very long and boring session. I'm going to... I'm going to quickly sum this up. So, music representation, audio and MIDI. For audio, you have the time and frequency domain. For the time domain, uh, it will tell you about amplitude envelope, uh, your ADSR, basically your attack, EK, sustain, release. Uh, it will tell you the beat and note position. And then for the frequency domain, it will tell you about the level frequency, category, and stuff. For the MIDI, it tells you about more high level music representation. Okay? Enough of this very boring talk. Now we are going to show some demos, right? So from now on, I'm going to talk about a few topics, different topics in music technology, and then how it's being applied, what are the fields that are being applied. Some of it we know about because it's very heated and it's a very hot topic right now because of AI and stuff. Some of it we don't really know about, but it's really, really important in the music world. So I would like to introduce to you guys. Um, I would like to kickstart with the first one, which is music generation. It's so hot, I have to start with this. So, um, around the time when ChatGPT came out, in, I think it's early December 2023, just after one month, uh, 2002, yeah, just after one month, Google released a paper called Music LM. Music LM is basically a text to music audio based generation model. And after that, a lot of people are just doing it. I'm going to just show you one by Stable Diffusion, uh, not Stable Diffusion, but they have an audio part of it called Stable Audio. So basically, you can just input these different texts, trans, Ibiza, blah, 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 synthesizer, blah, blah, blah. And then you just generate some audio, right? Let's listen to it. Decent, I would say. It sounds trans. Let's jump into here. I think it's okay, it's okay, it's not too bad, because they are stable diffusion, right? So, uh, this is basically one of the main trending topics right now in music technology. Everyone is talking about generation, yeah. But what I want to highlight to you is that music generation is not a new topic. It has been there for very long. If you guys are uh, familiar with one model called WaveNet, uh, I think a few years ago, four or five years ago, there's actually a first deep learning network that actually can uh, generate high fidelity, natural enough sounds, but very, very short. And what is the technical hurdle? It's because of the sampling rate, if you guys remember what I introduced just now. Audio is inherently long, and one second of audio requires 44,000 samples. It's not like if you're writing an essay, if you're doing a text generation. Text generation is fast because 1,000 words basically means how much? Uh, two, three paragraphs, right? And then if you have 44,000 tokens, it basically gives you one longer review. So it's a different magnitude of scale we are talking about. Because in audio, we need to generate that big an amount of samples. And sometimes you need times two, because you have left and right channels, you need to do stereo. Okay? So that is the technical model. So if you want to generate audio, how can we generate so many samples fast enough? That's the issue. So um, the recent success is actually good because they find a way to condense the audio information. Okay, so this enters into something called representation learning in deep learning. So basically, how can I condense information or how can I compress information? Right? There are two ways. One is called latent diffusion, very popular. You have heard of it, stable diffusion. The other one is called acoustic tokens, which we will briefly talk about. Stable diffusion is easy. It basically just takes the architecture from uh, the image domain, just copy and paste, nothing much. So you basically have a text form, and then you pass into some uh, very fancy or uh, what GPT model or something, maybe clap or maybe T five or something like that. You get some embeddings. You use the embeddings to condition your diffusion process. So for those who don't know about diffusion, diffusion basically is generating something realistic from noise through a, a lot of steps. So you're basically denoising, 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 and finally you get a product. So that's called diffusion. Um, so it's the same idea with image, and what makes it well is these latent features. Basically, it's small enough 
so that you can represent a few milliseconds in just one different feature. So that is where the condensation actually happens. And it seems like it proves that uh, basically the latent diffusion can condense information really well. Right. The second idea is something I'm more interested about. It's called acoustic tokens. Acoustic tokens basically is uh, by Facebook and many, many other people. Uh, one of the acoustic tokens proposed is called Encoder by Facebook. They basically train something called auto encoder. If you have learned deep learning, you know auto encoder basically takes an input, compress it into something smaller, and then you have a decoder which actually up samples it for you to reconstruct the output. So what they do is they train something like an encoder, an uh, auto encoder, and then they manage to represent one second of audio with 150 tokens. So imagine previously one second requires 48,000 of floating points. Right now, you just need 150 integers. That is a massive improvement in terms of compression and scale. And right now, one million of sound just require 9,000 tokens. Still not, but right now it's doable. So this is why right now, recently, we see all these trends going on. It's because of how we can use deep learning to represent data much more efficiently. Right? There are other tokens. So when you model audio into acoustic tokens, Things become really simple because audio task right now becomes NLP task. It becomes a language task. So let's say sound generation right now becomes text generation. It's basically the same. So this is the idea of acoustic token, which is very interesting. Yeah. What I want to argue is that um, all these music generation models might lack something, which is called controllability. For example, like the demo I showed just now, I can key in words and I can get an output, but what can I do with this output? I cannot change it directly. I cannot change less. I don't like this note. I don't like this instrument. I don't like this and that. I can't change it immediately. So controllability is something that we are lacking in today's models. And controllability maybe can easily, easily, more easily done in the MIDI domain. So some of the examples I want to show you about controllability, for example, music table nets. Uh, this is one uh, project that I did previously. The idea is basically that if you have a MIDI track, can I preserve the music idea of the MIDI track? But then I change some of the music attributes. So let's take a look. So let's say I have a, a, a sound like this. Okay, simple enough. Can I try? What if I want to reduce and increase the rhythm intensity of this song? How can I do it? Okay, but, but I want to preserve the musical idea. I want to preserve the motif. How can I do it? So let's, let's listen to a one with the lowest rhythm level. Yeah, make sense? No long notes. Second level. Third level. Fourth level. Yeah, so this is what we call about controllability. How this is done is actually something called the rational auto encoder. It's an auto encoder but more than zero. And then we can encode some of the musical attributes inside your learn latent space. So you can kind of like a fader that you can change it. So we can change it manually. So these are the ideas that we need to incorporate in our generation models these days. Uh, another example I want to show you is about auto-completing and remixing. This is also something lacking. Auto-completing and remixing is important because let's say I have an audio like this, but I don't, I just don't like this, uh, number 60 to 65 seconds. How can I remix it? So that's the idea. While, while keeping the context unchanged, I don't want to remix it and it gives me something different. Right? So an example I'm going to show you is something like this. Let's say I have composed some kind of uh, music that sounds like this. Some of you have heard it when you arrived early. <laughs> okay, can I remix it? Can the model remix it? Uh, we do have a model, uh, we as in that lab. So we do have a model that can do something like this. So let's listen to it. Let me know how it feels. Yeah, what about a second idea?
Now I have what we call uh, A section and B section because for one idea, I can generate variants of this idea. Then I have an A, B, A, C, A, B, something like that. I can already form something like a short song. What is the command all this into a song? It shows you that the context is crucial. So it's remixing and auto-completing or recomposing in the context that we have. And that is what deep learning offers us. So you go back to A. So this is how just imagine you are a composer, you want to do it, then probably do it A, B, A, C, D, something like that. And then you recall if the model can also do some auto completion. So, given some previous context, just continue and compose it. Yeah, so something like that. This is the idea of interactiveness and uh, recomposing, auto completing. This is the way that I think. AI should actually be continuing to explore in this generation three. Yeah. So um, speaking about this kind of assistive kind of intelligence, so another very interesting one I would say is music transcription or audio to MIDI. You can think of it as speech to text. So like uh, the very famous problem of transcribing what we are saying into text and then processing it. So this is equivalent in music, but I would say it's a little bit more harder because of uh, different kinds of, uh, of instruments, especially. And also, uh, there are a lot of music-related contexts, if you know about octave errors. Yeah, these are the issues that are just for audio to music and music transcription. And music transcription will be quite important and useful for scenarios like, let's say you have some recording, but you don't have the score, then it can help you transcribe the score. And what's important is that if you, if you have the MIDI, you can switch the instruments. So you can get to know what this piece sounds like, but in other instruments. So let's show you an example. Let's say we have this segment of audio. Right? When it's converted into MIDI, it becomes something like this. something like that. What is fun is that we can change the instrument. Let's say this becomes an overdriven guitar. Yeah, very nice. Something like that. Now you get the idea. Let's change one more maybe to uh, piano. Let's say piano, right? Yeah, but you get the idea. So the idea is once you have the MIDI files, you can do a lot of things with it. You can change the instruments, you can edit it, you can recompose it, that kind of stuff. So this is also one of the important things is in recent music technology. Synthesizers, let's talk about synthesizers. I give an introduction just now. Let me show you an example of synthesizer. So this is one of the open source uh, software synthesizers we have. This is called Vital. It's a wave table synthesizer. What is a wave table synthesizer? It basically means you store a very, very, very short amount of audio, very short, less than milliseconds. So you just saw maybe 512 floating points. And then when you play a pitch, you just repeatedly loop the wave table. So it becomes a sound. So this is called wave table synthesis. So if we do a very simple demo, so this should be a sound wave. Okay, a cut off there. So, so this is a sound wave, simple. Then what you can do is you can change this kind of uh, amplitude envelopes that I explained just now. So that's only like this. Right? And all these parameters can be changed and what you will have is all kinds of different sounds. For example, bells. 
and take drugs. So all of these instruments can be done by just one instrument and with all of the sounds by just picking different kinds of parameters. Now the problem is all of us are probably new to synthesizers, then we look at this and then we don't know what to do. Because too many parameters to change. We don't know how to program it. So deep learning can help with that. So what happens is uh, deep learning tries to solve one of the issues where synthesizer is a whole task for parameters to sound. Can we do the indoors? And the answer is yes, we can. So I actually came across this project. If anyone is working hack and roll, this is this year's hack and roll, one of the projects for Kamato. What they do is they try to change these very cute instruments, these, these very cute instruments, which sounds like this. Yeah, something like that. They change it into a web version, and then what they told me is that when they try to uh, tune the parameters of the synthesizer on web, they have a huge problem because it's so hard to tune it. So deep learning can actually help with that. Uh, there is a library called Synthion. Uh, it's just stuck with the library. <laughs> Synthion is actually what we do to um, do the inverse problem. So you input a sound and then you can output the parameters of the synthesizer. So I just picked from the video just now. Uh, I just cropped one of the sounds. Yeah, very short sound. And then run this uh, into prams. And then I actually get the result. So let me just pull out my phone again. Yeah. And then get the preset. Yeah, this is the output I get. Yeah, it's close enough, I would say. So this one is something like this. Mine is uh, between here, between here, it, and it kind of preserves the most of the harmonics of the sound. So this is one of the applications of deep learning. We know there's a wonderful tool here. We don't know how to program it, and we just let AI code program it. So that's one of the use cases. Uh, yeah. And is anyone any author of Wakamoto here today? No, right? It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um. Voice conversion, camera transfer, this is also one of the hottest topics in music technology. We have seen a lot of AI covers coming on. I love this one, which is particularly which is by Frank Sinatra, singing Viva La Vida. It's just freaking real, freaking real. Yeah. It's freaking real. Uh, of course, they don't. I don't think they directly take the uh, uh, Coldplay uh, recording. I think someone sang it and then transferred his own sound to Mr. Frank's Sinatra sound, right? How this is being done? So actually, this is a similar uh, task to sound transfer in image. So I've seen you guys. Uh, you guys probably have heard of some uh, sound transfer task where you transfer, let's say, a picturesque scenery into into Monet or Van Gogh or abstract art, something like that. It's actually a same idea. It, so the initial idea is to copy that technique to uh, audio, uh, directly treating the spectrogram we see the sound as an image, and then just apply the same techniques. Can it work? I see some questions. Of, Can it work? Initially, yes, but it will not up, be up to a very high quality. Yeah, you will lose some information, especially the face information in a magnitude spectrogram. So, uh, and then there's also some problems with the visual style transfer method because it's slow, it's costly, and then you will need to do a inverse Fourier transform back to audio, and you lose the face information. You need to reconstruct the face, and reconstructing face is a hell of a problem. So, recent uh, techniques are directly doing it on time domain. So, uh, previously, you have heard me mentioning this term called representation learning a lot in deep learning. So, deep learning is always talking about how to condense information learning some representation from something. And in this case, is learning a condensed representation of the instrument. So what happens is you have someone singing or someone playing something, you just extract the pitch information, and then you swap the uh, instrument embedding or the instrument representation. Then you get your timbre transfer. I want to show you a demo which is very cool. Someone uh, using his voice to directly... Let me see if this goes. 
I don't know what's it. Ah, I think it's really good. Yeah. Someone using his voice to play around. And it's real time. Yeah, so let's listen to it. So he's just using his mouth to make some noise and <laughs> yeah, but it's transferred real time into these drum sounds. Yeah, it's not post process. It's drum. Uh, it's real time. Yeah. So this project, highly recommend you check it out. It's called Wave. Yeah. It's basically using a very similar auto encoder again to compress timbre information, so that when you sing something into a mic, you extract your pitch information or some Text, texture information from your sound and then just do the conversion to another instrument. Yeah. So very cool stuff, uh, uh, voice conversion and tempo transfer. Source separation. This is also something interesting. When you have an audio file, it's often mixed with a lot of instruments, like your voice, your instruments, your backing track, your bass, blah, 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 going on. But let's say I just want to get rid of my voice. Voice is just nasty. And I want someone to sing on top of it. So source separation helps you do this. So from a mixture, try to isolate the ingredients from it. So an example will be uh, Taylor Swift's love story. Yeah, hope you get to see her concert. Uh, not concert, concert. Yeah. So yeah. What source separation does is it already extract four tracks from this uh, mixture, and you can isolate them. Quite clean vocals. Right? The bass? Yeah. Either you can remove the vocals when you sing yourself, or you either take his vocals and then you compose the backing track again. Yeah, source separation. Interesting sound. Very, very useful in today's music technology field. Yeah. And, um, Right now, I think the trend is more towards uh, separating more and more instruments because if you want to just separate two instruments for one mix, it's very easy. But if you want to separate ten, it's very, very difficult. So the technical uh, direction is moving towards there. Music content recognition is something I worked on myself before. So I mentioned an example before, like Shazam. So let's say you sing to your uh, a phone, something like, hey, uh, Google, what song is this? And then you play something. How does it work? So that song, that audio file, will be processed into something called an audio fingerprint. Right now, this understanding is some kind of hash or some kind of uh, some some eight byte information, something like that. And then that audio fingerprint will be cross compared with a huge database, either at cloud or on local. And then once you have a match, you will just return you what's the song. So the interesting thing of what is an audio fingerprint. So there are classical methods on this. When Shazam did it, I think it's 2012 or 2013, they're using a classical uh, digital signal processing algorithm, which basically says that for each of our spectrograms, I hope you guys know about spectrograms after today's talk. Yeah. Because, uh, every spectrogram, you can pick out the peaks in the spectrogram. Peaks are basically just short, little, uh, uh, high level, maximum value across a uh, uh, a range, right? So you just can pick up the peaks, and then you group these peaks out into something called constellation map. Constellation map is just a very fancy name of saying just group some of my peaks together, and then you have that peak. You just compute a hash on this combined group of peaks, and then you will get basically one fingerprint. But one song you have many many peaks, so you have many many fingerprints, right? When you have a query something like this, right? The idea is that even if you record your sound at a very noisy environment or using different microphones at different sampling rates of different quality, the assumption is that your peaks will still be the same. Yeah, because the noisy part will be a very low level, so it will be very soft. So after it's being filtered, you get a peak and it will still be the same. So you can match the peak with the original song. So that's the idea of the classical audio fingerprinting. But the problem is when YouTube came out. Then what we see a lot on YouTube is what we call night core ambition. I don't know if you guys know about night calls. <laughs> yeah. So what people do is they don't want to be, be copyright strike, so they record something and then they pitch it up, pitch it down, and then apply tons of people do some shit like that, and then they escape the copyright detection. Right? So this needs to be solved by recently mostly by deep learning. 
So what deep learning does is use something called the triplet loss training. Anyone know about triplet loss training? Yeah. Okay. So basically, this is the idea actually from image classification, which basically says that if I have a deep learning model and I learn something, uh, some some embedding or some vector, you can just treat this as a vector. So this model basically just takes in some, let's say about a few seconds of audio and just output one dimension vector. Let's say 78, uh, uh, let's say a 10 or uh, 12 dimension vector, right? And then you will do this for three different samples. One original, one variant, which is your cover, and then one is a non-variant, which is just some other sort. We call this a positive pair and a negative pair. The triplet loss idea is basically saying you want the output of the model between the positive pair to be close enough. So these two should be very close enough in your vector space. But then these two, the white one and the red one, should be far enough in the vector space. And you basically say that the distance between the white and the green one, L positive, must be larger than L negative by a certain threshold. So that is so that what 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 is saying is that uh, the close one should be close enough, the not close one should be far enough. Something like that. That's triple loss. And this is useful for audio fingerprinting today. Because what we can see is that in the past, variants are just uh, noisy sounds or just the original track. But uh, it cannot handle, let's say, covers. It cannot handle, let's say, orchestral uh, re-instrumentation, these kind of things. Now you can do it by sampling your own triplets in the way that you want. So this is basically how audio fingerprinting is done in recent days. Uh, I want to highlight one more which is something really interesting to me is about uh, division on device model serving. Oftentimes, the classical digital signal processing algorithms like your reverb or your compressor or things like that, these hardware panels are running real time. Be it hardware or software is running real time. But then, uh, why is it running real time? Because sometimes people use their computer for live performances, but hopefully you might have seen some electronic producers like they, they bring a laptop and then they plug in all kinds of their software and then they display. So it's a live performance. If it's not real time, then you will end up because let's say you have some glitch and then your performance just act up. Yeah, you don't want that to happen. So all of the audio related algorithms have a very clear constraint on having it real time and having it fast enough. And today when we are dealing with new machine learning based algorithms, often it's crucial. Because sometimes, oftentimes the algorithm is designed for GPUs to run. But then how can we bring it up to CPU to run? That is, I, I, I think this is the challenge for, I think, for many years to come. These are the gaps that we have identified in today's industry. So I think there will be a huge amount of effort in terms of firstly model design. So at first your model cannot be too big, it must be small, small enough. And then you need to run all kinds of optimization, like how to quantize your first model. Quantization means from a very big uh, floating point, you just truncate it into just a 4 bit or 8 bit integer uh, representation, that's quantization. Uh, pruning, which means you have a big neural network, just cut those you don't want, that's pruning. Uh, knowledge distillation is you have a big model, then you train a small model to mimic the big model. Yeah, something like that. So these are the techniques that we have to explore when we want to explore real time on device model serving. Like what we have seen just now on the uh, the voice to drums keyboard transfer. That's a very cool example. Yeah, uh, there are many more interesting topics. I would love to cover off them, but I, I didn't prepare. <laughs> of course, we don't have time as well. <laughs> it's already 47. Yeah, so uh, there are a lot, like for example, genre mode detection, chord recognition, uh, audio effect modeling. Audio effect modeling is important because, for example, uh, people have a lot of hardware, and hardware are pretty expensive, especially if you play guitar. The panels are pretty expensive. How can I emulate it with software such that it's much cheaper? And I can just bring my laptop and can emulate my panel sound. So these are really interesting topics that deep learning is helping using technology to solve. And of course, you have recommendation, hits of vision, and stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, I have a few lines of conclusion before I end my talk. So uh, a few findings I have for working in this field for a few years. So the first one is generative AI is exciting of course, since last year. But don't forget that non-generative AI is already valuable in music tech. As we see, source separation or content recognition or recommendation, these are all very valuable and also exciting, really exciting, I would say. So don't forget
forget about them. Yeah, generative AI is not everything. You can't solve everything by generatives. Remember that. <laughs> yeah. The second thing is um, if you are if you happen to work in a music domain, data is a big problem. Data is a problem everywhere. Then if you come to music domain time stack or times hundred. Why? It's because music are all copyrighted and you hardly can get non-copyrighted free accessible uh, music. But image and video is much easier. Yeah, either through any means. But music is a little bit hard. And oftentimes labels are more noisy. Reason being music is subjective. For example, today we want to train a classifier to classify mood or genre. And then listen to some song. Someone say this is a death metal. Someone say this is happy. Then how? <laughs> yeah, this happens. This is a real issue. So we did, uh, uh, I think, a data, some, some data task, I think, back in SUPD. Yeah, and then we try to label emotion at this. We have a hell of a day. <laughs> yeah, so this is the, um, I would say, the nature of working on music data tables in uh, uh Third one, methods in other domains don't necessarily work well in music. Some do. For example, some of them really prove that you can just treat the spectrogram like an image and just apply image techniques. Some of them work, but oftentimes they will need a huge amount of data and a huge amount of compute, which normally we don't have. So that is also something uh, I learned about in the music domain. The last one I think is more important and it's also something very important in today's generative AI bus, which is I think AI applications should be interactive in nature. Do you like think if you do this, it's fun enough, right? Not that I shoot them, but like they are doing a really, really good job, I would say. But the thing is, it's not fun enough. And oftentimes, if you see applications like paper transfer, like voice conversion, like autocomplete, like remixing, these which you can have involved human in the loop kind of music creation. I think this is more fun. And we should think more about giving the composers more controllability and making music making more fun and much easier so that more people can come and join us next time. Right? And with that, I will conclude here. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, go ask. These are my handles. If you want to talk about anything music technology related, please reach out to me. Anything. Yeah. With that, thank you very much. Yes, please. Oh, how are we doing it? Is this recorded? <laughs> uh, I'm thinking how to say it in a way that because it's not released yet. Yeah, uh, we do it not directly on the audio domain. Because we don't think that's the logical way to do. We do it in a way that you can change it. So the demo I show you is actually pre-rendered uh, audio files. Sorry? Ah, uh, the formal answer I would say is if you wait for one to two months, you know, because you release. Yeah, but the honest answer I have to tell you is that you will input a MIDI file. So Bennett users will normally com compose in MIDI. And what happens is, here, right, you will have these regions, and then uh, no, uh, I don't have a MIDI example here, but you will have some MIDI examples, right? And then what you can do is based on that MIDI, you can that is the input to the model, and that's how you make any auto copy remix model. That's your context into the input. So the input is your MIDI file, multi track, single track, anyway. Then train a model or design a model such that when it outputs, it outputs another MIDI file, yeah. So something like that, yeah. Uh, an analogy I can give is, for example, if you guys do sentence generation, okay, if you want to change or rephrase some 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 words, for example, I like uh, to eat something something, you want to rephrase it to something something is what I like. I think that's a similar task, and you can get analogies from there. 